right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's community conversation. My name is Marina Bach. I'm the communications manager here at Sierra Club Maine, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, these conversations have been a really great way for us to come together virtually and hear for, from some really wonderful organizations in our community. Today, we're really excited to have Anna Fialkoff of the Wild Seed Project join us. Before we get started, I just want to um, go over some Zoom logistics with you all. I'm sure you're pros by now, um, but we do ask that you please keep your microphone on mute to help with any background noise. We, um, you're welcome to be on or off video at your choosing. The recording, the webinar is being recorded. Um, so if you wish to not be seen, feel free to turn your video off. And lastly, we invite you to put any questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout Anna's presentation and we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to just acknowledge the land that we're on here in Maine. So Sierra Club Maine acknowledges indigenous land and sovereignty. We are in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the dawn. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations, and all of the native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations in what is known today as Maine, New England, and the Canadian Maritimes. Sierra Club Maine is honored to collaborate with the Wabanaki as they share their stories, and we thank the Abbey Museum for their leadership in decolonization efforts in Maine. And without further ado, I'd love to introduce our guest speaker, Anna Fialkoff. As program manager at Wild Seed Project, Anna works to further the organization's educational programming, deepen relationships with partner organizations, and catalyze a movement to rewild Maine. Before joining Wild Seed Project, Anna was most recently senior horticulturist at Native Plant Trust Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts where she designed and installed native plant gardens, managed interns and volunteers, and taught the public ways to incorporate native plants in their own gardens. Anna brings with her a deep knowledge of native plant ecology, horticulture, conservation, and ecological landscape design. She holds a BA in human ecology from College of the Atlantic and an MS in ecological design from the Conway School. So welcome, Anna. We're honored to have you with us here today. And without further ado, I will hand it over to you to get started. Thank you very much, Marina. And I especially really appreciated the land acknowledgement um, that you did at the end of your piece. Um, I think that's really important to be thinking about that we are on Wabanaki homeland. Um, so I will get started with my presentation now as does everybody see my screen okay? Okay. Um, and if you're not familiar with Wild Seed Project, um, I just want to get you acquainted with us. So we are a small nonprofit based out of Portland, Maine, um, small but growing. And we sell seeds of native plants. That's one of the primary things that we do. Uh, we also strive to educate people and uh, make people aware of the value of native plants. Um, the Wild Seed Project was started um, in 2014 by our founder, Heather McCargo, and she saw a real need for uh, more native plant education, as well as supply of native plants in local nurseries um, in northern New England and especially in Maine. Um, and since then, we have raised awareness and now the demand for native plants is growing. Um, the supply is working to keep up. <laughs> um, so we, we actually put out an um, annual publication. Um, we've had kind of a magazine in the past that is uh, filled with lots of wonderful articles by people from um, the conservation and ecology world, as well as gardening and native plant worlds um, with articles, but also uh, photographs and lovely illustrations. And our most recent publication is a native tree guide going in a kind of a different direction from our magazines. Um, that's more of a how-to resource for people on native trees. So, um, today, I really want to be talking to you about rewilding 
and what it means to rewild and giving you these 10 actionable steps that you can take in your own landscapes to rewild. Um, these 10 steps are not necessarily needing to go in order, but I kind of place them in order of importance, in my opinion. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to start with one or another. I think anything you do out of these 10 steps is a really big step forward. So just to give you a sense of the background of what rewilding is all about, um, many of you might be familiar with keystone species, the word at least, keystone species. And that's um, derived from conservation where it's kind of a tool to think about um, the way that we can help conserve different habitats and the most biodiversity possible. Um, I think the species like wolves and other kind of more charismatic megafauna have been emphasized as keystone species um, for a long time because um, the wolf, for instance, in Yellowstone National Park with its reintroduction in the 80s, um, you really did see start to see uh, a huge change in the landscape um, when the wolves were reintroduced because they were over, you know, overgrazed and not very much vegetation was thriving in much of um, Yellowstone National Park. And then when the wolves came, they kept a lot of the um, elk and deer populations in check, and then the, you know, um, the vegetation began to be able to kind of come back, and a lot of other kind of trickle-down effects happens from there. Um, so yes, well, our keystone species might be something like the wolf. We also, at Wild Seed Project, want to think about keystone species as plants. Um, plant, some plant species can be considered these because we also consider plants the basis of our food webs. And without our native plants, um, we start to see them unravel. So Doug Tallamy has done a lot of work um, in researching. He's an entomologist at the University of Delaware, and he's done a lot of work in researching insect and plant relationships, um, especially those of moths and butterflies and plants and native plants, because it's their caterpillars that, so in, in that one part of their life cycle, earlier on in their life cycle, the caterpillars actually rely on um, native plants, their, their leaves um, of many trees and herbaceous plants and um, alike to feed themselves. And then in turn, songbirds, especially in spring, rely on that protein rich diet of caterpillars to feed their young. They also rely on other insects throughout, um, throughout their whole lives, um, but and as well as berries and fruits and nuts of, of native um, trees and other plants. But it's those insects, especially those caterpillars that are extremely important for them. Birds are actually kind of thought to be the bellwether of ecological health and, and well-being. And so if we can create um, healthier insect and bird populations, I think that we'll be better off overall. Um, in this time, we've actually started to see quite a bit of a, an insect and bird Armageddon. Um, populations of insects have dropped and in turn, populations of migrating birds have dropped um, throughout the world. So Doug Tallamy's research does point to this kind of threshold of 70% native plant biomass that's needed to keep these food webs intact. And if you haven't, I also actually, before I leave this slide, I wanna um, just say that if you haven't had a chance to, um, it would be great to read something by Douglas Tallamy. So one of his more recent books is Nature's Best Hope, and it outlines a lot of what I'm talking about in this presentation, um, different action steps that you can take to rewild your landscape. He might frame it in a slightly different way, but a lot of um, our rewilding movement is based off of what um, of Doug, Doug Tallamy's research. So I encourage you to read any of his books, um, Nature's Best Hope, Bringing Nature Home, or The Nature of Oaks. So rewilding um, at Wild Seed Project really means, you know, we use it as a verb. Um, it really means to us uh, something kind of threefold. It's not just about restoring native plants to um, our 
our landscapes, but it is a big portion of it. If we can restore native plants and the natural processes where we live, not just out in national parks or large conservation areas, um, actually where we live, where we um, have our homes and our businesses, where our communities thrive, um, then this is going to reverse habitat loss and support biodiversity. We also need to think about what we do in the landscape, not just what we plant, but if we shift from harmful habits um, to more mindful practices that benefit wildlife and the planet's health, then we're going to um, have a much bigger impact. And then finally, we all really need to come together and join forces with others, whether it be our neighbors or family, friends, or larger community to connect these fragmented habitats that have been fragmented by development um, and become an advocate for native plants in our landscapes. So all of the 10 action steps actually hone in on all these different pieces of what rewilding means and how to do it. The first action step is to think about getting as many of those um, trees into the landscape that are keystone plants. And the keystone plants idea, the, these five native trees has really come from a lot of Doug Tellamy's research because um, he's discovered through his research that oaks, willows, and cherries, and also plums, um, birches, and poplars are, you know, host to more biodiversity, more uh, caterpillars of moths and butterflies than any other native plants. So starting by planting this kind of infrastructure into your landscape is a good idea. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't also plant other genre of native plants, but these are really important ones to start with. And then you can kind of fill in from there with more diversity. So um, the oaks, for instance, you know, they host at least 400 to 500 species of moths and butterflies. Um, depending on where you live. So maybe in Delaware, it's closer to 500 plus, And in Maine, it's a little bit more close to 400 plus, but it's still significant. Um, I I'd like to give you an example here of a tree that is one of these keystone plants and the life cycle of one of the uh, moths that it supports. So I was um, a horticulturist at Native Plant Trust before I started at Wild Seed Project. And I really enjoyed getting to firsthand do some moth rearing and butterfly rearing. Um, I raised them and got to see their whole life cycles. So the Cecropia silk moth was one of the ones that we were most successful with. Um, we raised broods of Cecropia silk moths. We raised, we started with their cocoons. Um, they would overwinter. Um, in a cage to kind of keep them safe from predators over the winter. And then we'd um, put them in these pairing cages, which are kind of like a netted cage with a little window that you open at night because the, the moths, once they hatch out of their cocoons or are closed from their cocoons, um, they come out, uh, they, they, you know, pump their, the, um, their wings to kind of get everything uh, flowing into their wings and then they emerge at night. Um, the males fly out and find a female, you know, up to a couple miles away. Um, and then they mate and it, it might take a couple days for this process to happen. And then the males will pretty much go off and pass away. And then the females will lay their eggs and then they'll die after a couple days too. So their, their time as adults, the winged adult stage, which is so beautiful, they're about the size of a small bird, um, is very, very short. And they spend most of their lives as caterpillars feeding on the leaves of their host plants, like black cherry is one of the preferred host plants of the Cecropia silk moth and then overwintering as cocoons. Now the Cecropia silk moth actually um, will hang on a branch late in the season around August and start spinning its cocoon pupating um, and then overwinter hanging on that branch. Well, there's many other moth species that actually um, drop down from the native trees and overwinter in the leaf litter. That's kind of a precursor to what's coming next. So um, like the luna moth is a really good example. Its host plants um, are usually trees in um, the walnut family. 
and, um, and a few others, but um, it actually will drop down from the leaves and pupate and its cocoon will, will overwinter in the leaf litter until it's ready to close the, the following spring. Cherries also, you know, provide much other wildlife value too, to bees and other pollinators with their flowers in spring, and then later to birds and mammal, small mammals um, with their heavy fruit set. Um, cherries are actually edible to us as well, the, the, the wild black cherry, um, but it does vary, like tree to individual tree to tree can be really either tasty or bitter or um, a little too tart and astringent. So um, it's really uh, kind of funny how that varies, but for most mammals, they don't seem to really mind one tree or another. I think for us, our palate might be a little bit more refined in that way. So planting native trees doesn't just involve planting a singular tree in the ground in a sea of lawn. Um, I really hope that when we do plant native trees, we kind of step away from this more park-like look um, that has, is, this is, you know, going on in, in this kind of planting is going on in, in many of our commercial landscapes and our parks and arboreta. Um, but it's not necessarily going to create the health of a forest uh, when you plant a native tree. So if you don't have leaves under that tree, then you don't have opportunities for those different caterpillars or of moths and butterflies to drop down and overwinter in the leaf litter or spend some sort of part of their life in the leaf litter. So this native black gum is a wonderful native tree to plant. It's a slow growing plant um, that can stay small and kind of conical shaped for much of its life. And then when it gets bigger, it does create more of an irregular canopy and it's absolutely gorgeous with its fall color. It also hosts a lot of life. Um, for from its um, berries to its fruit to its leaves, it hosts uh, has lots of opportunities for um, being a wildlife magnet, and it can be used as a street tree. It's a really great tree, but I would encourage us all to kind of think about when possible planting native trees in more of a forest-like setting and mimicking the forest layers. So um, I really like this example here at Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts. There's a flowering dogwood. It, that's even not the full um, canopy tree. There's oaks that you can't quite see as well in this picture that are in the canopy. And then the flowering dog, dogwood is um, in kind of the sub canopy. Then there are trees and shrubs, smaller trees and shrubs like rhododendrons, azaleas um, that are even lower down. And then May apples and ferns and marybells, which are the ground covers, um, the herbaceous ground covers. And all those layers in the forest play a function. Um, the canopy um, trees sh shelter and shade the forest floor. Many of the small trees are flowering trees, providing lots of pollinator opportunities. And um, the same with the shrubs. Um, many of the herbaceous plants do that as well, but also if they create a ground cover, they um, keep the soil from eroding, keep moisture retained in the soil, and um, create kind of a green mulch. Um, below that, if you can leave the leaves, that is a great thing to do for wildlife. So native street trees are also important to think about. Um, you know, they don't have to be a large tree necessarily, but um, I think something like a beech plum, which I think it's classified in with the cherries as one of the keystone trees, is a great thing to plant if you have a small space. So the beech plum, you know, bear really tasty fruits. They're about the size of a cherry, um, but they're, they taste just like plums because they are plums. And their flowers bloom in spring, providing lots of pollinator options. Um, and they also, um, you know, are host plant to moths and butterflies. And the, you know, I, I encourage you to take a look at um, that recent publication that we put out, Native Trees for Northeast Landscapes, because we actually have uh, about 31 species of small, medium, and large um, native trees that would work well in a variety of different landscapes. And we have, um, 
a couple different nice plant lists. One is street trees, a native street cheese. And then another one is um, the, a list of plant guilds. So thinking about the trees, the shrubs, the herbaceous plants that all work together that grow in similar growing conditions that you can plant in your backyard. So it, it's a nice kind of cheat instead of having to create your own plant list to, to look at what we have in that plant list. Um, but yeah, beach plums are, are some of my favorite native small trees to plant. They, they can actually become a little bit more like a, a scrubby um, shrub um, if you don't kind of um, prune them like a tree. So if you prune them more like a tree, it's just a matter of when you grow them at a smaller stage, uh, when they're a young whip or something like that, you prune out the smaller, start by pruning out the smaller kind of leafier branches lower down and allow for maybe one to three major stems um, that end up becoming kind of the leaders. And um, if you prune the leafy, leafy branches out above your, at around eye height or a little above, then that gives it also more of a tree-like look and a tree-like feel. This one is kind of being grown um, in, and being pruned so that it can um, stay kind of more, a little bit more on one plane in this small garden bed up against uh, a road um, or a, a driveway. And I think that's another nice way to have them too. The second rewilding action step is to think about shrinking your lawn. So many of us might know um, the detriment of lawns, but lawns are, are really not healthy landscapes for a number of reasons. For one, they're practically sterile. Um, they don't actually have many opportunities for wildlife value. And um, there's in most of our lawns, you know, the the single species Kentucky bluegrass lawn that often many of us are trying to maintain um, to look clean and um, well taken care of. It's actually sprayed with lots of fertilizers and pesticides and those can become major pollutants in water bodies and also become a detrimental to many of our pollinators. Um, and then, you know, we mow our lawns and in order to keep them at a certain height, we have to mow them over and over again throughout the season. And that create puts a lot of fossil fuels into the air. If you do have an electric mower, that's great, but it still requires energy to mow. And then not to mention that lawns are actually the second most irrigated crop in the US. Um, if you kind of take a minute and think about that, why are we putting so much of our, our precious water resources into lawns when they often are just the default in our landscape and not really are not really doing a lot for us? Um, I think, you know, lawns do have a place. They're important places for outdoor rooms um, and, you know, places for gathering and recreation. We need something to play soccer on in the backyard, to throw Frisbee on. Um, and as pathways that convey us through the landscape. But otherwise, you know, all the lawn that's left over in our suburban and urban areas could be taken away, um, all of that that's not being utilized. So why not stop mowing a good portion of your lawn and maybe leave the outside frame of the outdoor rooms and pathways unmowed um, for places for pollinators and other wildlife to find forage and cover and shelter. Um, you can do a couple different things to shrink your lawn. You can either stop mowing, which is actually a slightly more advanced technique. And I don't recommend it for the beginner um, because you'll see, especially if you're in an urban or suburban area or an agricultural area that's um, surrounded by a lot of invasive species and weeds, um, you'll have a lot of that coming up. And it's a lot to manage, especially if you're unfamiliar with the species that might be coming up in your lawn. But it is doable. Um, some, If you do have an area that um, has a lot of native species already present, then it might be more doable um, for you. Um, but you can theoretically stop mowing and allow what um, you know, the plants that you uh, find beneficial to keep reproducing and then kind of discourage the plants that 
are weedy or invasive to not keep reproducing. And that can be by a number of techniques, including mowing and smothering or mowing certain areas that are, um, that are you know, full of the non um, desirable plants or smothering certain areas that are you know, filled with invasive species, manually removing them, making sure to cut those plants back before they have a chance to go to seed is essentially what you wanna do for the plants that you don't want there and allowing the plants that you do want there to go to seed. But I'm not gonna go into a huge depth um, on this method today because it's a little too complicated to talk about in a short amount of time. Another way that you can reduce your lawn is to think about um, starting over and adding new plants into it. So that might involve sheet mulching the lawn, which is a really great method to get rid of your lawn. Excuse me, there's a big motorcycle going by my window right now. Um, but so if you sheet mulch, that means you can put down cardboard um, and maybe make sure it's nice and overlapping in either spring or fall, and then put mulch on top of that. And that mulch can be aged bark mulch or aged leaf mold. Um, and you can find those either locally um, at your um, you know, local landscaping business or find a good business that, that does it well. Um, and let those age for a good three months or so. So if you're putting it down in the spring, let that age for the full growing season and break down and add organic matter to the soil and smother the grass below. And then um, plant into it in the fall. Or if you put it down in the fall, plant into it in the spring. So one of the interns at um, Native Plant Trust's Nasami Farm, which is their plug nursery, decided to convert uh, as her intern project, um, this big lawn parking lot island into native lawn alternatives. And she actually put down um, sheet mulch in the spring and then planted into it later in her internship a couple, a couple months after she put down the sheet mulch. She put down lots of great lawn alternatives like the Pennsylvania sedge, which is a grass-like plant. It's not a true grass, but it doesn't require as much mowing and inputs and water as a lot of native or as a lot of non-native grasses require. And she put down um, foam flower. She also planted three-toothed sink foil and pussy toes, which are great for the drier and well-drained sunny spots in the lawn. And this whole network of um, native lawn alternatives was kind of a trial to see how each one would do. And eventually they all started to knit together and some would do especially well in the spots that they were most well suited to, while maybe others that were not as well suited to an area would fade out and get taken over by another. So it was kind of a nice experiment to see how that worked out. And I think it was very successful. Another way you can think about shrinking your lawn is not necessarily by doing a giant project all at once, because I know that can be very overwhelming, but to think about kind of hemming it in each year just by a little bit. So you can uh, put down your um, cardboard on just the edge of, garden, of a garden bed, kind of thinking about edging that garden bed in the way that you'd like, and then put down your mulch on top of that and then plant into it in a couple months. Um, and that will create a nice new edge of your garden bed, kind of extending it out. And if you can think about, um, instead of just planting lawn alternatives, maybe lawn alternatives are great for certain areas that you would like a lawn-like look or um, would like lawn in, but you want something different than Kentucky bluegrass, that's great. But if you can put multi-layered plantings into the areas that you can, um, change from lawn, that's actually even better. So um, this is brings me to my next action step, which is to fill every open niche in the landscape. And so if you can have as many layers in your landscape as possible, or if you're like me and an apartment dweller and don't have many places to plant natives, you can do things like put them in pots, put them on um, window boxes, I actually put the, the center um, bottom photo is my apartment. And this is where I've actually put in a lot of native plants and pots like cardinal flower and iris 
and blue lobelia and uh, Virginia creeper, all sorts of lovely natives that do well in pots and many, many do. And it's a great way to experiment with what you have. Um, I also think it's important to think about filling every niche of the landscape by help um, encouraging vines. Like I love this native vine on the upper left that's called coral honeysuckle or trumpet honeysuckle, both the same same plant but different common names. That actually attracts um, many pollinators, including hummingbirds. And it creates a really nice dense, kind of almost shrub-like structure where um, I actually think it provides a lot of cover for birds. So this was a vine that was outside of the, or it still is outside of the horticulture building at Garden in the Woods, and that used to be my office. Um, and whenever we'd open the door throughout the growing season, we'd we'd hear a bird fly out. And I think we realized over time that there was a nest of robins inside this, um, this really densely growing um, trumpet honeysuckle. And what was great about it is the trumpet honeysuckle is not one of the more kind of aggressive vines. It stays in, in one central place. And it's just a lovely one for any sunny um, average soil spot. You can also think about planting um, natives into what's called the hell strip or that space between the sidewalk and the road where it's a really tough pl place for a lot of things to grow. Usually, especially around Portland, a lot of those hell strips are filled with grasses that have just kind of seeded themselves in non-native grasses or lawn, or they're just empty dirt pockets. Um, sometimes they have trees growing out of them, but nothing else. Sometimes I see people plant like a ring of native or non-native, but of annuals um, into those hell strips. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to um, do if you have a hell strip in front of your um, house to you know plant native plants in like cone flowers. And um, I love the idea of the prickly pear cactus. It'll keep dogs out of it, <laughs> as well as the Carolina rose um, with their armored foliage and prickles. Um, so that's a really great way to think about adding more natives into every little spot in your landscape that you can get them. And you can take it even further. If you do have some yard, you can cram as much as you can those layers that I've been talking about, stack pack and layer things. You can add more containers that add some really lovely seasonal interest when things are not in bloom, if they have, are colored and glazed terracotta, um, or things that don't fit in your landscape, like maybe a small shrub that wouldn't be able to fit into this small garden bed here. Um, the small shrub that's in the corner is actually a aromatic sumac that turns lovely colors in the fall. Um, and I love just the way that this little courtyard, um, informal courtyard is, is planted with trees and shrubs and vines, um, asters and goldenrods and cone flowers and all sorts of things that are filling every little niche. And actually a lot is in bloom in this fall landscape. It's quite beautiful. Another way that you can think about filling every open niche is thinking about urban areas again and taking cues from uh, the Miyawaki mini forest movement. So Mayawaki was, uh, or is a Japanese man who brought over the idea of um, planting many, many um, small native seedlings and saplings into a small area and kind of mimicking a mini forest. They actually have shown, research has shown that these mini forests um, will actually grow into the layers and biodiversity that a more mature forest can hold in about two to five years versus you know, 50 to hundreds of years for um, a um, regular forest. So this is a really great way to add biodiversity into um, a, an area that, that isn't very wild. It, it might look a little bit more wild. It's a great way to take like an abandoned lot or you can do this in a much more kind of neat and garden-y way, but um, this is sort of a more wild looking one. Um, it's actually been something that's, this is a movement that's been taking hold across Europe and the UK, for instance, has planted um, at least 150 of these tiny forests across their cities. So I think we can take cues from what's happening around the world and do it um, 
in the US and do it in Portland, Maine or other um, cities and towns in Maine if we can. Our next action step is to think about targeting certain pollinators to support in our landscapes. So we can do that by planting those keystone plants. And I wanna highlight a few other keystone plants like the, the goldenrods and the asters, as well as coneflowers and other plants in the aster family are considered also keystone plants because they host hundreds and hundreds of moth and butterfly caterpillars um, on their leaves. Asters and goldenrods are also really essential plants for late season forage and nectar of nectar and pollen for bees and wasps. So um, if you can plant an aster or a goldenrod in any new planting that you put in, um, and there is one suited for, at least one suited for any new garden that you put in. Um, I think all gardens should have them. So the Canada goldenrod is one that is, gets, gives a lot of our goldenrods a more of a reputation for being weedy um, and creating kind of large swaths of just one plant because they are a little bit more aggressive. But there's actually a lot more um, garden worthy goldenrods that we can look to uh, to plant instead, like the wreath goldenrod or another name for it is the blue stem goldenrod, the downy goldenrod and the um, zigzag goldenrod. Those are those three species are available on our seed sale. And then there's so many asters as well for different conditions and that are garden friendly, like the blue wood aster, the white wood aster, the flax leaf stiff aster, that's more for sunny spots. Um, and I encourage you to just take a look at all the diversity of asters and goldenrods that we do have and think about finding one that can work for your site. Another way you can look at targeting certain pollinators to support is to look at one pollinator maybe that you would like to support in your landscape and trace its life cycle and find out what it requires. And then you can actually manage your landscape accordingly and plant accordingly. So the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, for instance, if I wanted to support that one, it is in decline in much of its range. And its range, actually, its native range does reach um, up to southern New England, not as much into Maine. But I think with climate change, we could start expanding its range and in, in, including also bringing its numbers back up where it is. So um, I think we could you know, plant more of its host plant, which is the white turtle head. That's one of its main host plants, at least. Um, and it leaves its or it uh, lays its eggs on the undersides of the white turtle head in the spring. Um, when its eggs hatch, the larvae come out and they go through different instar stages like any other insect. Um, they um, that means that as they get bigger, they shed their skin and um, take on kind of a slightly different look with each instar stage. But they stay together. They're a little different from a lot of caterpillars. They're gregarious. So they form a protective webbing around them um, to, protect, to protect them from birds and other predators. And they use this webbing actually to make little bridges from one branch to another. When they've eaten all from one, they can go to a fresh branch. Um, then they crawl down to the leaf litter. They actually take two uh, years to complete their life cycle. So they crawl down to the leaf litter at the end of the growing season and overwinter in the leaf litter as caterpillars, leaving them extremely vulnerable to any disturbance in the leaf litter. Then they crawl up and eat more for the rest of the next growing season and then pupate um, into these gorgeous chrysalises, starting the cycle over again. So what does that mean? It means that we need to think about planting more of its host plant in um, its native range, as well as, as um, leaving the leaves when possible so that they have a chance to um, reproduce year after year. So um, that brings me to the next action step for rewilding, which is changing your management regimen. And that includes leaving those leaves. I know that's a hard thing to, for a lot of us to kind of wrap our heads around with different gardens that we might have or different landscapes. For instance, if you do live in an area with a lot of blacktop and lawn, um, it's definitely tricky to figure out where all those leaves do go. If you're gonna leave all of them on your garden beds, I know that um, 
it can be tricky to you know think about you know the new emergence coming up through them the next year is it going to smother the lawn is it going to smother my plantings those are all things that go through a lot of our heads and so to mitigate that we're often mowing and blowing and carrying our leaves off site rather than keeping this precious resource on site um, to add to our garden beds and yes there are often too many leaves so one thing that you can think about is to reduce your lawn like in the earlier action step and that will provide more um, planting bed spaces for the leaves to go um, or to consolidate your leaves by either um, composting them in a, in a compost pile or shredding them, but shredding them can be um, detrimental to those pollinators that overwinter in them as well. You can also think about um, cutting back our, you know, certain standing vegetation, but leaving others up. Um, so over the winter, I like to make sure that I don't cut back every bit of standing vegetation, especially things with, with important seed heads that will be forage for birds over the winter or grasses, places for birds to find cover in. Any of my nice structural plants that look nice, I'll keep up. And then sometimes I actually will cut back in the spring those pithy or um, hollow stemmed plants like common elder and Joe pie weed, cone flowers, um, et cetera, flowering raspberry, for instance. Um, in order to open up the chambers for um, some of our native bees to lay their eggs in. So those pithy or hollow stemmed plants provide a lot of opportunity for um, both hibernating bees as well as um, young larval of uh, lar uh, larvae of bees for them to lay their eggs in and, and for them to overwinter in. So um, another thing that you can do, you know, is leave those fallen sticks and um, branches in the landscape and you can clean up to some degree without cleaning up too much. So re or think about reorganizing, I guess, instead of cleaning up. Um, it can be a great creative opportunity to do things like create a beautiful fallen log sculpture in your yard or woodlot or pile up sticks. Um, that have fallen instead of you know taking away all the messy sticks and putting them in the compost or burning them um, or making a leaf column or different debris fence that uh, organizes your materials and helps break down your leaves a little faster um, eventually some of those leaf fences actually become living fences as um, the bottom layer breaks down pretty quickly and becomes compost and a lot of native plants in your yard might start to seed into them, like the wood poppy in this picture. Um, also, there's other ways that you can add wildlife value to your site without doing the gardeny things, but thinking about other things in your landscape like um, having some sort of water feature it could be a bubbler or just a bird bath or even a waterfall or taking some stormwater infrastructure like in this photo. Um, the gutter that's come off the roof goes into a really um, neatly crafted stormwater plan where it goes into an old satellite dish and then that tips into another um, gutter that goes into a retention pond. There's some really fun things that you can do. That running water sound is actually going to bring migrating birds in the fall closer to your property. And if you have native plants there um, to feed them with nuts and berries and insects, then you're going to have all the more reason that for those birds to stop um, on your site. Also lowering the lights that you have on your site or making sure that their lights are not pointed upwards or having motion, motion sensor lights is important for moths because they move around a lot of the time at night to find um, their partners to reproduce and they can get kind of caught by lights. They're attracted to lights and never finish their what they set out to do. Other things like having bird boxes and bead bo um, bat boxes and things like that. I, I know that um, bee hotels have become pretty popular lately, but I actually, unless you're, they're used as an educational tool for kids, I don't think that they're actually always the best because um, those do need to be cleaned out pretty frequently so that diseases don't spread um, among bee populations. So I think if you can leave those 
um, pithy or hollow stemmed plants in your um, garden, leave open spots of soil, um, especially sandy soil for certain ground nesting bees and leave logs and things like that for any bees that nest in the hollow chambers of logs in old woodpecker ho holes and things like that. Um, those are all gonna be better and more kind of long-term solutions for creating bee habitat. Um, next, I think we can think about stop, stopping fertilizing and using pesticides in our landscapes. These two things are not really necessary for beautiful and healthy gardens or plantings. And um, I'll go over a few reasons why and how you can reduce these things in your landscape. First of all, I think fertilizers are really, I think, you know, left over from more traditional ornamental horticulture where you're often um, trying to amend the soil to meet your, the plant's needs. Um, when you plant something from another continent or a lot of veggie gardens need richer soil. But uh, a lot of our native plants, some native plants need rich soil and some native plants need poor soil, some need well-drained soil, some need high pH, some need low pH. And so if you can find the plant that's best suited to the conditions that you have, the light and the soil conditions, then you're gonna have a much more sustainable landscape than um, having to constantly you know, take soil tests and add amendments um, to your soil to make it better suited for the plants that you plant. Um, pesticides are also not really necessary for beautiful and healthy gardens. Um, and so I encourage you to all think about stopping these practices because these do become major pollutants and contribute to um, things like colony collapse, um, which is something that European um, honeybees have gone through, but a lot of our native bees are actually um, you know, eating and consuming a lot of the leaves of plants that are treated with pesticides and that's detrimental to them too. So this can carry into where you buy your plants from. So becoming a wise consumer is important. And the things that you need to think about are um, buying plants that haven't been grown with pesticides if possible. And most native nursery, I mean, sorry, most nurseries in general do um, actually grow their plants with pesticides these days. Um, and it's a real problem. So you can do things like call your local nursery that you want to buy plants from and ask them if they use things like neonicotinoids um, and ask them to stop using them or say, you know, tell them that you're going to go to a different nursery that doesn't use them. And the consumers will drive the demand for these organically grown plants, just like um, we have done for lots of our food, uh, organic food products. Um, or you can also grow your own native plants. Um, if you grow them from seed, even better, because those plants will be more genetically, have more gene genetic variation and be better adapted to potential futures like stressors from climate change, the drought and flooding and um, periods of heat. Um, and you'll have, they'll be cheaper and you'll have a lot more fun doing this at home. How the seed sowing um, calendar works is that you actually, for native seeds, you actually sow them in late fall through early winter. And so you get to do some gardening when nobody else is out and about in their garden. You can do this inside though. You can sow them in pots, cover them with sand. Then you put them outside with some screen to protect them from rodents and let them overwinter. In the spring, they should start germinating for, for most species. And then you can grow them on for that growing season and then plant them the following fall. So it's a really fun way to kind of get out and do your own gardening and reduce the cost of plants um, as well. Because I know that it can be overwhelming to think about how many plants you need to buy to replace your lawn. And getting towards the end here, um, another thing you can think about with rewilding is removing invasive plants. And I know this can be an overwhelming thing to do. Um, I think if we can think about it more as a community effort, we're going to be better off. Um, so in our public places, we can think about getting groups of people together 
like the rewilding name movement. Actually, it's a, a separate movement, separate rewilding movement from the Wild Seed Project rewilding movement. It was started before Wild Seed Project's rewilding movement. Um, it's a group that actually um, hopes to spread awareness and education about um, certain skills and um, things, you know, different techniques that are nature-based and based on a lot of times traditional knowledge or, um, or, you know, skills that have been lost. So things like basket making and things like that. And sometimes they have different kinds of workshops where they remove an invasive species like the Asian bittersweet and then do basket making with those stems afterwards because it's a nice flexible um, vine. And I, I really like the idea of kind of creating more movements like this, as well as you could gather friends if on your property and work on an invasive pullout or at your local school. Kids love to do stuff like this. Um, it's very empowering to do it with a group of people and see how much you get accomplished. And then after you've removed your invasive plants, definitely make sure to replant with rugged native plants. We have a great plant list on, our, on the Wild Seed Project website. Um, that goes over all the different native plants for different conditions that you might want to replant after removing an invasive. Because otherwise, those invasive plants could come roaring back. And so once you've removed an invasive plant, that's not the end of it. You do have to think about care for that area and tending it for several years afterwards, at least. And if you plant with native plants, that will fill the void um, and get that those plants establish to kind of battle, battle it out with any new sprouts of, of invasive plants that might be coming back. So with all of that being said, those are all different kind of actions that you could take on your own or with a group of people. But I think it's best if we can join forces with others to um, spread the message about rewilding and what we can do to support more life, life in our landscapes. That can involve putting out a yard sign for, you know, that might show people why you're not mowing a certain section of your yard or a leave the leaves sign um, that explains why you're leaving the leaves, that you're not just neglecting your site, you're actually doing something intentional and giving people those cues to care um, so that it doesn't look just kind of like a wild, unintentional um, landscape. You can also with these um, yard signs really um, kind of reach out to people in a non-confrontational way. So you might get neighbors or passers-by asking you about your yard signs and what you're doing. And this could spark some really good conversation um, rather than kind of you know, grumbling at your neighbors next door that they're mowing too much or fertilizing too much or that they should do this or that, this allows them to come to you um, and ask questions instead and get curious. And um, you can also do things like use the hashtag pledge to rewild. We're trying to encourage people to use a hashtag for their neighborhood too. So it might be pledge to rewild Portland, Maine for their city or um, pledge to rewild Longfellow Square. That's where I live um, to show that you're actually um, doing this in a specific area, and then you can link up with other people that are doing this somewhere else. You can use the Nextdoor app. Um, and the next thing that we're working on with, at Wild Seed Project is figuring out ways to get people to connect with each other and share their rewilding together so that they can also connect habitat. They can both join forces to spread this message, but they can think about their neighborhood as maybe a connected wildlife corridor that they're creating. So maybe multiple neighbors in a neighborhood are doing this. And when you have more native plants, it's going to attract more, um, more pollinators. So maybe in an area that's isolated, you might have a new native planting um, without any other native plants around. And you, you actually could see um, not very many pollinators at first, but if you get more and more habitat in your area, um, then you're going to have a larger area to attract the pollinators and allow them places to migrate through. And you can think about educating the wider um, community around you. Um, so 
using something like our resources at Wild Tea Project. We have a couple of great resources on our website that you can use to educate um, the wider community. And that might be the Portland Pollinator Vision Plan. This was actually a project done by students from the Conway School in Massachusetts. And they put together this plan looking at all the different places that they could add while a pollinator habitat in the city of Portland. It could be, you know, public places, could be neighborhoods, businesses, parks um, that would be plantable and potentially where you could get landowners to come together and create these corridors. Um, so this is one way to look at it. And we really hope to flesh this out over time and start reaching out to um, to different municipalities to get this message spread even further. Also, uh, we have a great resource called the Maine DOT Roadside Guide on our website too. So this is something we actually worked with Maine DOT to create a guide for um, helping sustain populations of native plants along our roadsides and our median strips and on the edges of the highways and roads throughout Maine. And uh, this involves both uh, a different kind of management regimen or mowing regimen for the roadsides, not mowing during the growing season, and then doing more um, seed collection and allowing as much um, as many native plants to kind of populate the roadsides as possible, while also maybe inv removing invasive species in favor of native plant habitat and maybe doing some restorations in certain areas. So this is another um, resource that we'd love to be spread far and wide. And both of these are available on our website for free to look at. So thank you, everyone. I hope this inspired you to take the pledge to rewild. And when you do take the pledge, it's actually um, you're going to get all these free resources. It doesn't cost anything to take the Pledge to Rewild. We just want to inspire people to take action and plant natives in their own yards. Um, and so you also, while you get something out of this, you get free tools and resources um, and guidance in these 10 action, actionable steps and links to articles and all sorts of how-to information. You also get to show our collective impact. So you get put on a map um, that shows all the pledged rewilders um, in the US. So I hope that you can join us in this movement. Thank you. And I'll, I'll leave you when we, we do a Q&A after this, I'll leave you with some uh, resource slides. So I'll go through them kind of slowly so you can take a picture if you need. So thank you again, and I'm open to Q&A now. Thank you so much, Anna. That was really awesome. Um, so much helpful information. And I, I know I'm going to take the pledge and I look forward to slowly trying to figure out how I will rewild my space. So thank you. Um, I'd love to take any questions for Anna. You can put them in the chat um, and I can read them to her. One question I had, uh, Anna, I was wondering about the leave your leaves sign. Um, mm -hmm. I love the idea of that and kind of starting a conversation with your neighbors. Is that sign something that we can get from the Wild Seed Project or where would we find something like that? It sure is. It's actually on our website. We have a shop page on our website. So if you go to the main website, wildseedproject.net, um, up in the navigation bar, the shop is right up there. And you'll see that you can buy native seeds, you can buy yard signs and other merch like t-shirts and aprons and hats and things like that. Um, but those two yard signs, the do not mow native habitat sign and the leave the leave sign um, are both available on our website. And we hope to actually come out with more native um, sign or native habitat and rewilding signs soon that have other kinds of things written on them or a more general one for rewilding to say that I took the pledge. Um, so, um, you know, the, look for those coming out soon. We'll announce it in our newsletters and on our website and everything, but keep an eye out. Awesome. Um, we do have one question from the chat. Can you incorporate vegetables into your native garden? Yeah, of course. Um, so I gave that kind of rough 70% native plant biomass um, goal. And if we can strive for that in our landscapes, I think that's great. If you want to do 100%, that's awesome. But if you if you feel like you also want to have a vegetable garden or integrate uh, productive, edible, and um, 
or medicinal or herbal plants into your landscape, some native, some not, I think that's great too. I don't think we have to kind of go all or nothing. And it's definitely not a purist approach. Um, so, you know, whatever you can do to incorporate natives, there are actually a lot of great native edibles. So if you do have an interest in that, um, I recommend you also take a look at our, our, some of our different blogs on our website, because we have a couple of them um, dedicated to native edibles too. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, one other question. When you, when you stratify seeds to sow in spring, can you do this at the beginning of winter and dry them again? Um, let's see. So, so stratification is the process that um, keeps the seed, it brings the seed from its kind of dormant phase where it's not going to sprout into the sprouting phase, that germination phase. And it's, it's going to be a process that helps break that hard seed coat and allows it to germinate. So that means it might be um, adding moisture and cold to the seed um, or scraping it down or going through, if it goes through the digestive system of, a, of an animal, that's a, a form of stratification for many different native seeds. And each native plant has a, a different type of um, stratification that it requires. Um, so once you do that, you probably don't want to dry out the seed because usually most stratification includes moistening the seed to help break its hard seed coat. And um, once you do that, it's already kind of off on that trajectory to germinate. So you probably wouldn't want to dry it out after that. All right, good to know. Um, another question here. So someone is wondering if Wild Seed Project is involved with schools in terms of native seeding as classroom projects, anything like that? Yes, we, we are. We, um, we actually offer, um, we have a program where we offer teachers and schools a couple of free seed packets each year. And so we usually send out um, a call to teachers in one of our newsletters in the fall to let them know that we wanna do that. Um, we wanna add on to our programming for um, schools and teachers because we do think reaching out to youth is really essential, getting them excited about plants and learning about the life cycles of plants and their pollinators is wonderful. So we have a couple of um, different projects that it, we're working on, but we haven't um, finished any of those yet. So look out in the next year or two for um, different local Portland schools that we'll be working with. Also, um, we do have a really nice resource on our website for, um, it's, a, it's a plant list for um, people who want to uh, think about native plants that would work really well for schoolyards. So definitely check that out if you're interested in planting some native plants in a schoolyard, because there's some plants that are just great uh, plants for kids that are kind of more whimsical or, or edible or medicinal and uh, would work well in a schoolyard. Awesome, that's great to know that you're uh, involved in schools and I love the idea of planting uh, in schoolyards, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, Patricia says that uh, I actually bought some seeds from the Wild Seed Project last fall and started them in pots as suggested, but I left them out too long and ended up with a mess of roots to disentangle. When, oh. is, the, when is the best time to transplant them and would you pot them on or move them directly to the garden? We get that question a lot. That's a good one. And I don't think you waited too long. I think you could plant that whole pot um, in the ground just as a big mass of, of little seedlings. And that's okay too, actually. That's one of the methods we suggest. And um, you could do that in the, the coming spring. I think right now it might be a little bit late for planting because when you plant, you wanna allow, though fall's a good time to plant, I'd say that's more like um, the end of August through September and then maybe early October, but fall, um, can be a little, you can get a little late if you're not giving that plant enough time for its roots to start anchoring into the ground and keeping the plant from heaving over the winter with the freeze and thaw. So that's something to consider. Um, you could plant it next spring or next fall. Um, and if you wanna learn more um, tips and tricks or just get some question, you know, an questions answered about your property or your plantings, 
feel free to become a member and then you get access to these monthly Q&A sessions that our founder, Heather McCargo and I um, lead. And we answer people's questions for a whole hour over Zoom. So um, it's a really great way to you know, learn from other people's question and answer and, and then hear your own um, answered with the group of people on the Zoom call. Oh, that's awesome. I'm sure that's super helpful. That sounds great. Yeah. Are I there apologize any for the drilling that's happening outside of my house. It's really loud, but. <laughs> oh, no problem. We can barely hear it. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Anna? One last question I had, um, you mentioned a lot of um, removing invasive plants. Do you have any tips or tricks on identifying what is invasive and what might we want to keep? Yeah, I think um, invasives are, are most of the invasives are really easy to identify compared to a lot of other plants. Um, and that's because they're ubiquitous in the landscape. They're everywhere. Um, so what I would do is um, when you're when you're in doubt about a plant that's coming up in your on your site, um, let it come up and maybe go to flower. Um, and when a plant's in flower, that's usually most of our resource guides and our field guides are geared to identifying plants when they're in flower. Um, that's a real important tool in identification. And you can, you can look at things like, um, there's some field guides that I really like that are handheld um, that you can take with you, um, like Peterson's field guide. I also really like Wildflowers of New England by Ted Elliman that has photos of our native plants um, and naturalized and invasive plants. I also like Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. That's one of my absolute favorites. For apps, I think iNaturalist is the, is the best. Um, there's also things like flower checker, but unfortunately those use um, algorithms of photos. So you could have some wrong answers from something like flower check or checker or picture this um, because it's not going through um, the real process of elimination um, with identifying your plants. Um, I also really like Go Botany. That's an online key, and that's that they have a simple key that's made for beginners as well. Um, and then if you look at, um, let's see, um, the Maine Natural Resources Council website, that will have uh, lots of information on Maine invasive plants, and it'll have photos and identification guides and um, a little bit of information on how to remove them. Uh, as well. So that's a nice thing to do if you if you think you might have an invasive plant, it'll it'll show you, you know, the top invasive plants to look for. Awesome. Thank you. That's helpful. And I, I've seen the apps on phones and stuff. So I'll check those out and the guidebooks. Thanks so much. Um, we have someone wondering if they could be added to the email list. So what would be the easiest way to be added to the wild seeds email list? Yeah, so if you want to be on the, our newsletter list, you can go to our website and you'll, if it's the first time visiting the website, you should get a pop up that um, asks you if you want to join the newsletter and just follow the prompts. Um, otherwise, you can go to the bottom of the page and there's a little button for that there too. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions for Anna? All right, well, with that, I'm just going to um, share my screen one more time. Just one. Share. What's that? There, I stopped sharing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. All right, well, I just wanted to thank everyone so much for uh, joining us today and a special thank you to Anna for um, sharing so much knowledge and awesome action steps and things we can do at home to better our environment. Thank you, Anna. It's been, really been a pleasure to have you. Um, and I will send everyone the recording of this presentation and also some follow-up steps and links that Anna has sent me so that you can get more involved. And as far as Sierra Club, we invite you to follow us on social media to stay updated on our work. You can also subscribe to our newsletter there. And then before we take off, I just want to invite everyone to our next community conversation, 
which is um, next Tuesday, October 19th at noon. So a cross-sector collaboration is working together to understand the ecological benefits and community benefits of oyster reef restoration, specifically to Phippsburg, Maine. So I hope you join us. Um, we can learn about oyster restoration and the collaborative community-based approach to addressing the rapid changing coast that we have here in Maine. And I'll actually put a link in the chat where you can um, register to that. And I hope to see you there. And thank you so much again, Anna. It's been awesome learning about all of this. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Bye.